that skill down. Oh, wasn't that great? Yeah. Welcome everyone. You're invited to join us at the front of the sanctuary and we'll get started. Shirley wants you to know you shouldn't be afraid of the front row, that it's very comfortable. Good morning, welcome to the Unitarian Church of Evanston. I'm Reverend Susan Francis. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the assistant minister for congregational life here at UCE. Shirley Adams is my worship associate this morning. And if any of you have our paper orders of service, you will see that there's been some shuffling of people and where it says Reverend Eileen, that will actually be me, Reverend Susan, and where it has my name, it will be Shirley this morning. We're so happy to host the Chicago Area UU Council's Spring 2024 Conference. Here at UCE, we strive to be a welcoming and inclusive community, nurturing the human spirit for a world made whole, and living out our shared values and covenant. As part of being a welcoming and inclusive community, we have some information that will scroll through on our screen that will help orient you to UCE today and to our service. We have accessible and gender inclusive bathrooms in the lobby and also on the lower level. The lower level is accessible via an elevator which is at the base of the ramp in the lobby. There are exit doors behind the chancel there are exit doors in the middle of the room, heading out to Ridge or heading into our lobby out to the parking lot. And there are two exit doors at the very back in the glass wall, which is also where our kitchen is. And so you're invited to take good care of yourself today. And if you need coffee or hot tea or lemonade or water or a little snack, to go back to the kitchen and make sure that you're feeling nourished. Please feel free to ask me or anyone with the little welcome lanyards. Um, we're all UCE volunteers and we'd be happy to direct you if you have questions today. Our congregation is a certified welcoming congregation and so we are super excited to be hosting this conference focusing on expanding our welcome to ever wider and wider circles. Those joining us online are invited to get your chalice and your candle and your matches as we start our service today. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning and welcome again. I love doing this part of the service. This is where we get a little history and do our land acknowledgement. UCE strives to be mindful of the history that led us to being able to worship in this building and on this land. So we also strive to be mindful of the history that informs our present and shapes our future. So at the end of my words on this acknowledgement, you will be invited to join in a communal statement, a brief communal statement of shared commitment. So our congregation resides on land that was recorded as being transferred from the local Potawatomi community to the U.S. government in 1829. Shortly before the Potawatomi in this area were forcefully removed west of the Mississippi River, this land was then sold to white settlers. Today we remember the ancestors of contemporary African-Americans, 
the individuals, the families, the networks of black people who built up our country's culture and our economy. And we know that that role was enforced on them originally by enslavement. We also acknowledge the intentional violence that landed on our shores in 1619, and it has continued, and that it has continued throughout the generations and remains a reality today. So these words and acknowledgments are one small effort toward building long-term solidarity with contemporary communities. We commit ourselves to take what we learn here today and incorporate it into our lives turn our thoughts into actions. And as a way of affirming that, would you join in our words of shared commitment, which will be on the screen? Yes. Which are on the screen now, so we'll repeat that together in unison. We name these realities with honor for all the ancestors, respect for our descendants, and gratitude for the land we use as sacred space. All right, so now we're gonna light our chalice and Dana Dean and uh, Jeannie McCullough are gonna come up here and do that for us. Um, rec sort of representing our Rainbow Alliance group and our denominational affairs team. The chalice is a symbol of our living tradition. So we invite you to join in saying the words to open to unexpected answers, which was written by Julianne Leap. And the words will be on the screen, so we'll, we'll again say these two sentences in unison. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our child's Remind us, this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Oh, so now you get to take a deep breath and rise in body or spirit. And we're going to sing that wonderful, wonderful hymn, at least that you use, love it, called Gathered Here. It's hymn number 389, if you have a hymnal, but the words are on the screen. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit drawn. One more time. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Thank you. We're a small group, but that was really robust. Thank you. Please be seated. Our reading this morning is, I cannot prove to you that I am, we are human, by Reverend Julian J. Soto. I cannot prove to you that I am a person, but you can hold my hand, cool and dry, while we pray or just breathe. Ragged breaths catching on our aching ribs. I cannot prove to you that brown skin is holy, that black skin is sacred, but you know it, luminous and irrepressible, the tabernacle of your own liberation. I cannot even prove to you that every queer body, every trans and envy body, every ace and bisexual body sings back to the universe its immense generative power of yes. I cannot prove to you with quadratic certainty that what a disabled body holds is a story of wisdom beyond perfection, like a red sun emerging from behind a cloud of dust. So the answers that I have 
for a country hacking up a death rattle and a democracy with a wheezing, waxy pallor are about our courage to love. Our desperation, not only for survival, but also to tread above the worst of our collective nature, to set each other free, unashamed that there came a day when we were willing to risk looking foolish to simply stay together and alive. This will be performed by Lizzie Powers, who is a member of our congregation. It's The Joke by Brandy Carlisle. Lizzie is in the ukulele band, which is great. Welcoming congregation, safe space, brave space, beloved community. These all describe the creation of spaces where one can express one's authentic self, one's entire self. The creation of these spaces is actually one of the challenges of our times. 
I watched a webinar on mindfulness this last week, and the presenter, Nancy Nolan, reminded the audience that we are all spiritual beings. Whatever our beliefs, from theist to agnostic to atheist, humans are creatures who seek answers to questions. Questions about why do we exist? Questions about what happens when we die? Questions about how should we treat each other and the natural world? For those of us with identities that fall outside of U.S. cultural norms, finding a place to explore these existential questions can be complicated. I had my call to ministry as a 16-year-old around a campfire at a Methodist church camp. The Methodist church I grew up in was not anti-gay, but it was gay silent. It was a neutral place where I felt I could not share parts of myself. It was not until I walked into a UU congregation in my late 20s that I felt I was in a faith community that would not focus on my most marginalized identity, my queerness, but that would or ask me to set it aside when I walked through the door. But a faith community that saw me in my entirety and easily engaged with my entire self only then, when I could bring all of me, when I felt whole in my interactions with people in the congregation, was I able to live my best self, which led me back to that ministerial call from my teenage years. My lived experience of searching for a welcoming spiritual home is but one example of why we, as a Unitarian Universalist faith community, cannot be neutral. Neutral is not safe. It is not brave. It is not welcoming. Transforming from a neutral space to a welcoming space is what the Welcoming Congregation program is about and is what the Welcoming Congregation renewal process is about. If your congregation is not yet a place where same-sex couples and their children can come and feel at ease and bring their entire selves, then the Welcoming Congregation program is a gift, and I invite you to open it, to explore, and to embrace it. The Welcoming Congregation renewal process acknowledges that while Unitarian Universalism has largely done a good job of normalizing identities around sexual orientation, it has not yet transformed our congregations into places where transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming folks feel at ease, where they feel a sense of inclusion. I was recently introduced to a quote by Verna Myers, who happens to be the vice president of inclusion strategy at Netflix. She says, quote, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Gay men, lesbians, bisexuals, asexuals, those of us with an array of sexual orientations, we are living it up on the UU dance floor of most UU congregations. At the same time, our gender expansive siblings identifying as trans, non-binary, genderqueer, and a host of other gender non-conforming identities have been told that they are welcome, but sit in the chairs along the wall waiting to be invited onto the dance floor. And those of us with intersecting identities, intersecting marginalized identities, such as identifying as being gay and disabled, or identifying as being trans and as a person of color, are even more likely to be waiting to be invited to the dance floor. We must break down the cultural norms that create boundaries to inclusivity. This often means being uncomfortable in a setting or a conversation until our minds have normalized it. We must engage with identities different from our own with curiosity and humility and respect 
And this means remembering that we do not have the right to ask personal questions in order to educate ourselves at the expense of another person's dignity. We must shape our congregations into welcoming spaces, which means educating ourselves, following the lead of those already present in our congregations with marginalized identities, and acting in ways that allow for the first person with an identity outside of our congregation's cultural norms to show up, engage, and be embraced. Our faith is so unique in this society, and I believe it holds one of the keys to our society's future. Our covenantal nature gives us the ability to hold multiple views and continuums of intersecting identities while remaining in relationship with each other. This exploration and embracing of a continuum of identities is one of the great gifts our queer communities have to offer to our society. We have largely left behind the binary of straight or gay to live into the continuum of relational expressions of love with straight and gay simply having their role on the continuum. We have largely left behind the binary of cis or trans to live into the continuum of gender identities with cis and trans falling into their place along the continuum. This continuum means that we are often identified through the letters of our smaller identity groups. Three common examples are LGBTQIA, RTNB, GNC, R2S, LBGTQ+. And my personal identity letter, P, I identify as pansexual, isn't even in these. And it may be one of the reasons I like the plus. I add the plus every time I'm using identity letters. In general, when folks from the queer communities come together, we do so to celebrate the unique qualities of each person, to embrace and support and love the unique identities each of us holds within us if we choose to, if each one of us here today chooses to be part of transforming our congregation's culture of welcoming, then each UU congregation is capable of being a community where individuals with any sexual orientation or gender identity may be part of the community, may experience love and care, and may have a place to explore the existential questions that almost all of us grapple with. It is a profound gift to have a place where your culturally marginalized identity is not what you have to spend time and energy being focused on. And instead, you get to spend that time and energy grappling with larger questions of consciousness and culture. And so I invite you all of you here today online and in person, whenever you fall into the continuums of gender expression and sexual orientation, I invite you into this transformative process of creating. Creating a welcoming congregation, a safe space, a brave space, beloved community. You are so valued here that there is a space to explore your existential questions and theological ponderings. Bring your entire self and let's dance. Our dance today is going to be in the form of a glitter blessing. We are all transforming every moment of our life. Each of us is unfolding and becoming more authentically ourselves as we practice loving and being loved. To honor the love and divinity in each of us and what is emerging, we will bless one another with glitter. And it is environmentally friendly, biodegradable glitter, and it's in a gentle, uh, gentle on the skin aloe vera gel. 
So Shirley and I will bless each other and then we'll come down the rows and bless each person on the end of the row and you can pass it along. As soon as you are blessed, pass the blessing to the next person and you're gonna ask them where they would like to receive the blessing, on their forehead, on their cheek, or on their hand. And if you are not interested in having glitter on you today, you can just put your hands to your heart and receive the, the verbal blessing and pass it along. So Shirley and I will demonstrate and the words of blessing are on the screen.
blessings. Our closing hymn is 1053, How Could Anyone? And we're going to sing along with a recorded version from the Sacramento Gay Men's Chorus. They sing the song through three times, which is the way that the songwriter Libby Roderick suggests that it be sung. The first time we sing it through, we sing it to remember how to sing it in the words. And then we turn to someone next to us and sing the words to them. And then for the final time, we sing it to ourselves, really letting the words soak in. So please rise in body or spirit and sing along to our video. in body or in spirit, and we're going to we're going to do a responsive reading to extinguish our chalice. Oh, okay. So, as we extinguish our chalice, and I'm going to invite yeah, Daniel to do that for us, symbol of our living tradition, would you join us in reading this poem? It's called Benediction to Build a World by an Evanston po poet whose name is Atina O. Danner. It's from her book, Incantations for Rest. So for this moment, I'll be the leader and I'll ask you a question and you will respond with your answer, all of you. So. Another blessing. <laughs> In what world are you powerful? In this world. 
In what world do you act on knowledge and truth? In this world, we can learn and move toward justice together. In what world do you hold to your values in the face of what scares you? In what world are you confident in your worth? In this world, we can affirm that each of us is enough. In what world do faith and beliefs guide your choices? Together, we can build this world. In what world can you learn from those with less power? In what world could empathy shield you from judging others? In what world will your power plant roots and tend to branches and leaves? Blessed be. Please be seated. This concludes our worship service, but I just want to say that you are loved as you are. Today, in this place and at this conference, you are invited to be present with your whole self, joined in a community seeking to know each other. I want to welcome up Mike Gilley, the president of the Chicago Area UU Council. Blessed be. Thank you, Reverend Susan. What a, what a great and somewhat unexpected service. Unexpected in the sense that they hadn't shared with me in advance how, how on point and related to our topic today this, uh, this service would be. And uh, so my name is Mike Gilley. I use pronouns he and him. And I welcome you to this space, this safe space, this brave space this beloved community. I wanted to first off thank the people who have worked with me to organize this event, who have come together uh, month after month, the Calc board, and uh, if you would actually stand, please, Karen Brooker is here, Irene Raven, Don Parker. Uh, Stephen Trout is not here, he's in Europe. He might be watching from YouTube, he threatened that he might, he might do that. Uh, only Adam knows in the back right now. Uh, what uh, my job to do here today is to help uh, keep us on somewhat of a track, and we're already a few minutes behind because we had a lovely service. And so uh, my welcome to you is going to come to an end <laughs> <laughs> so that we can continue with the conference. And, and uh, I, I had created a uh, handout that hopefully everybody has that it includes the agenda for today. So you just have a rough idea of what our schedule is. We're going to uh, begin with Kim Frank, who is representing uh, Youth Outlook as uh, one of our keynote speakers to help us with a bit of fundamental education uh, relating to this to this space, to our uh, the world that we live in now, that includes LGBTQ and plus, and that plus and that range, that continuum that exists. There's a lot of terminology that even those of us who have been attending UU congregations and have friends within that the community, people that identify that way as close friends and family, uh, there's a lot we all can learn. And following Kim. Uh, we'll be joining uh, by Rebecca Kling, who uh, I'll introduce it after, uh, after Kim speaks. And after Rebecca's keynote, then we will uh, uh, have a networking lunch. And there will be an opportunity for Q&A after each of the keynote speakers. So we hope we've baked in enough time to allow for some interaction and discussion uh, at that point. And then after lunch, which is about a half an hour of time that we've allocated here, 
uh, we will then have a, a panel discussion. So we'll be inviting panelists uh, who have agreed to participate in the event uh, to join so that we might ask, uh, pose some questions. There was some preparatory kind of work leading to the conference where we asked a little bit more about uh, their experience, you know, in the world within a UU congregation and outside of UU congregations, and we hope to explore that a little bit. And following that, we'll have a breakout group, which uh, will be invited to go into various rooms, not here in the sanctuary, uh, where we'll be able to continue with some questions that we're going to pose about, about welcome and what we can do to create a more welcoming and inclusive uh, you know, congregation, community, and world, and what education we need to take on ourselves. So with that, uh, what I'd like to do is give a little introduction for Kim, who I've known for 24 years or something like that, because we're both members at Countryside Church Unitarian Universalist. Kim has been working with Youth Outlook for 15 years, uh, supporting LGBTQ youth as a program coordinator, a youth leadership trainer, and a community educator. Uh, she has served as a high school youth advisor and trainer to many youth advisors uh, for 20 plus years uh, in the, at Countryside, but also supporting the Mid-America region or what used to be known as uh, the Central Midwest District. And uh, uh, the objective there being having safe and meaningful conferences bringing together youth who are going through at that period of time a self-discovery, a self-awareness, a time of experimentation. So such an important time, such important work. Uh, Kim is also the chief of staff at Humboldt Park Health, a safety net hospital that provides equitable, equitable uh, care in the Humboldt Park community and beyond with their ambulatory, ambulatory care program. And Kim has a bachelor's degree in social work from Northeastern University. Kim, please come on up. Good morning. I am going to put this here. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everyone, for taking some time to be here today. Adjustments? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, they might use that for sure. Um, so one of the things that I want to say is while I'm talking today, um, and we're going to cover some of the basics, and then we're going to ask some really good questions. And I was really appreciative during the service that kind of came up a couple of times is, what is that curiosity? What is that healthy place that we ask questions? now? I've been at UU since the early 90s, and I love to laugh at myself and my fellow UUs because we, we do love to ask questions. And then, and then also there's that part where we're like, oh, but not those questions, like, because that's going to make me think I might not be like the best, awesome, most coolest UU ever. Um, and, but that is the challenge. And, a majority of my work in the UU spaces have been with kids, with the senior high groups. And they, uh, one of their favorite things to do is to identify themselves on what they aren't, what they don't do. Well, I'm UU and that's so great because I don't believe this and I don't believe that and I don't have to do this and that. Um, and then that always begs the question, but what do you believe? What are your values and how are you going to walk in the world? And they never want to answer those questions. They're like, I just like to know what I don't have to do. Um, so, th so this opens up a really wonderful opportunity for us this morning to talk about what are the questions and what are the questions that, if you've already gone through the process of being a welcoming community, you need to ask again. Because that's also important, right? Everything in our growth life is cyclical. And so questions that we asked 10 years ago, there's different answers now. So we might need to investigate that a little bit more today. Uh, so a few things that I'll say uh, about myself, just so um, 
to put it out there. Uh, in my time at Countryside Unitarian, I've been a lay minister, a youth advisor, a con manager. I've been an advisor training. And then Mayan, uh, which was the Mid-America Youth Advisor Network, there for a brief, beautiful time, all of the educators, the senior high youth group educators, would get together and have this awesome network of shared and collective wisdom. And that's why spaces like this are so important, because these are opportunities to learn from each other. Um, and so I really got a lot of really great opportunities to hear what was going on in Unitarian youth groups. It's really awesome. And somewhere around, actually it was the early 2014, the youth group at Countryside had one transgender and two non-binary youth. Now, Unitarian youth groups are not incredibly large. Unitarian congregations are not always incredibly large. And so my thought was, if in this 10-person group, I have three young individuals that are identifying in a non-binary, different part of the LGBTQ community than we were used to, statistically, how many other youth are out there that are not identifying themselves, that are not here in this church. So I went to Youth Outlook because I was a volunteer at that time and I had done my internship there. So I already knew they did great responsible work and I said, what would it take to open a space in Palatine? Because I think the community is out there. And all of the safe spaces were largely in the city, Howard Brown and Center and Halstead, all those great places. Um, so they said, yeah, if you can set up the space, great, do it, knock yourself out, see what happens, right? So we sent out flyers to all the local high schools. We sent out flyers to all the police department social workers. We said, hey, we're gonna open this space in Palatine. We don't know what that's gonna look like, but on Wednesday night, we're gonna open the doors. We spent all of a month, you know, getting as much information as we could out there. And the night in May of 2015 that I actually opened the door, I had a group of 10 kids standing in the parking lot waiting for me to open that door. So let's ask those questions, like what, what happened there? Um, well, the most important part was somebody was there to open the door and create the space. We reached out, we let people know this door is going to open on Wednesday night and here's what the space is going to be for. The movie Field of Dreams was not the blockbuster it was because it said, if people show up, go plow a field. It was, if you build it, then they will come. You have to put out the effort, you will have to create the space, and then that allows the community to come out and be present with you. But you have to be willing to put the work in ahead of time. Because there is safe space that you're creating in order to hold brave space. But I want you to think about what it means to have brave space. Because it means it's going to take courage and bravery to show up in that space. So it cannot be chaotic and it cannot be an idea or a theory that will allow people to feel brave and courageous enough to show up. You can't say, well, the door was unlocked and the rainbow flag was hanging out there. Why do I need to do more? That, that does not invoke or encourage bravery. That's like the least amount you unlocked the door. So you, it is important to keep that in mind. Sometimes I think as Unitarians, we get stuck in a little bit of a vacuum. Where we're like, but don't we all know how welcoming we are? Don't we all know how much we want to be a part of our community? Well, you know, I thought everybody knew that too. But when I created that space for the kids on Wednesday nights, I had to spend a lot of time reaching out to every high school and every police department and every library. And, I had to get the word out there and let them know that I wanted them to come there, that I wanted to extend an invitation. And then they could come in and have a good experience and share with their friends and then other people would come in. Um, but I just want to highlight that because as we talk about doing the work of a welcoming congregation, 
Being part of a Unitarian church is not enough. And hanging out a flag is not enough. And saying, but it's in our values, it's on our website. From my point of view, what that's really saying is if you decide to do the research and the work, you'll find us. And, and that does not actually fit with my values because then I'm not actually reaching out and I'm not saying it is my desire to connect with you and let you know this is a safe and brave space to do that. I'm just like, well, if you're lucky enough to discover me, you know, then you get to enjoy this space. Like, I think that's, those are those questions we have to ask ourselves. We can't just know it. We have to be willing to show it. We have to be willing to create the space and then promote the space, even when nobody shows up. Because in Kevin Costner's baseball field, there was a lot of nights where that field was empty. And that has to be okay. It doesn't mean that the space isn't sacred and doesn't deserve to be held. There are nights when I open the doors to the teen center and two kids show up. One night, one kid showed up. Um, and we always have other adults, so it's never just two people. Um, and so I said, you know, this is awesome. This is now your official night and we will have whatever conversation you need to. Um, they are an incredible computer geek. And so actually it just ended up being me and the volunteer asking them all questions about our computers all night. <laughs> Um, so we all won by holding that space open um, and they really loved being like, I am the authority for this evening's purposes. And so great, like it is what it is. But the doors have to be open and the space has to be held. Because then the next night it might be seven kids that walk in. And also if we just made that kid stay, fantastic. Um, so. So I just use that to kind of dispel that, that myth of, well, can't we just create the space if it's needed? Like right now I don't hear anybody complaining in my congregation, so I'm pretty sure we're okay. And I want to dispel that. Like you know, it is our responsibility to create the space and extend the invitation. It cannot always be on the person that is already living in a marginalized situation and we don't know what difficulties they're plowing through every day of their lives. They should not have to plow through to find us. It should not be another task. Or boy, I sure hope you find a welcoming congregation. No, no, no. We have way more spoons. And we're a group. We're a massive group. We're a congregation. We're not asking one person in the congregation to do it. We do it as a group. We spread the word. We hold the space. We take turns. I mean, that's what, that's community. That's what we say we are. So that's what we need to do. The other thing that gets difficult, uh, and it's a valid statement, I'm exhausted. My congregation is exhausted. Not everybody came back after COVID. Not everybody shows up in person. We don't have the funds, the bandwidth. So I want to validate that those are all completely reasonable statements. It is truth and it happens. Now, there is a difference though in saying these are things that we have to work out as opposed to these are the reasons we don't do the work. I have, I have slides. So if you get tired, learn to rest, not to quit. Now, I bet lots of smart people have said this, and maybe there was a person that said it long before Banksy made this print, but I'm going to let Banksy have some, have a space here. I have this poster uh, on my dining room wall. It is okay to rest, but it is not okay to quit. It is not okay for that to be the reason the work isn't done. Again, you are a member of an entire congregation. So take turns or, you know, let people like there's ways to figure out. I have three weeks to be in and two weeks to be out. Whatever that looks like for you, I trust everyone knows how to manage their time. But as a congregation, that's not the reason that this falls off the top priorities to do in your community because it's a, 
It's a commitment we've already made and it's important to hold to that. So how many in this room, and if you're on Zoom, um, I hope somebody's paying attention to the chat because uh, I want to know if there are questions and comments that come up. For me, I like this. Um, this is so much more fun if it's conversational. So if you happen to think of something while I'm talking, feel free to raise your hand or throw a comment in the chat box. And we'll pause and pivot. Um, this is why I enjoy working with high school youth so much, because you can pause and pivot. And you can go from talking about the best Netflix show to world peace to hunger and then sporks. Uh, and it's all getting us somewhere. Um, and I want to know what your needs are today, and I want to address those to whatever extent that I can. Um, so how many here have been through the welcoming congregation process? Some, some, okay, awesome. Um, and how long ago was that? <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago. This is uh, me and a group of high school students from Palatine when we went to march in the Pride Parade in Chicago at, with our precious banner that says, we are a welcoming congregation, right, 2007. So here's what I love about this picture. My hair is brown. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking at it, and let me tell you, every kid holding that banner, Heather's married and has a kid, Anna is working for United Airlines in Europe, um, Greg lives in Texas, Bill is expecting his first, my son Jason in the green shirt just turned 40. So. When we say we've gone through the welcoming congregation process and we did all that awesome work, good job. But if it was 20 some odd years ago, if it was 10 years ago, heck, even if it was five years ago, how different does your congregation look now? These, these kids aren't at my congregation anymore. I have a whole new batch of kids coming in. They're all out doing the work of the world. So the processes and conversations, the very important deep conversations that were held during this process, that's lost information to a majority of your congregation right now. You know, the lifespan of a youth group is three-ish years because it's not really that common for a kid to stay in youth group for all four years, work and sports, etc. And we used to joke at some of our Unitarian Youth Conferences that if ever there was a practice that we kind of was hoping it needed to go by the wayside. All you had to do was delay it for three years and all the new kids wouldn't know it ever existed. And so that is really why the idea of re-welcoming, of re-experiencing, of renewing and refreshing is so important because you're gonna have a lot of people in your congregations that are unfamiliar with that whole process and why it was important. And then even those in your congregation that went through it and remember it well, are you the same person you were in 2007? You are a vastly, I hope you're a vastly different person. Like that is the goal, is to grow and learn and stretch. So you will also have new conversations, new insights old myths you didn't even know you had, those sacred cow thoughts that you were like, no, 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 this is, we're good, my congregation did that. Um, but the world looks very different. So even the conversations you were having are not going to address a lot of the LGBTQ community now and the experiences that they're having. And the terminology is different. The terminology is different every week. I rely on the kids every Wednesday night to let me know what I don't know. And that's with a weekly update and I still can't keep it all straight and I'm still behind. And some of it they don't want me to know. Sometimes I hear them use a phrase or a word and I'll be like, ooh, that's new, what's that? And they all like, you tell her, you tell her, I'm not telling her. <laughs> I'm like, well, somebody's gonna tell me because I'm about to look it up on my magical phone box and then we'll see what I come up with, you know. Um, 
But this is part of that responsibility of being a welcoming congregation, is knowing that everything has changed and it always will change, and it is up to us that if we want to stay welcoming, we can't do it the way we were doing it 10 years ago. Because we're missing, as Reverend Susan pointed out during the homily, we're, we're missing folks. And, and if we don't know the terminology and we don't know the evolution of the journey of gender, how are we making space for that? These are people that are looking for places and we're saying, come hang out at our place. And then when they're showing up, they're, the, the, it just doesn't really represent who they are. So then we're irresponsibly saying, no, come in the door. We're so cool. And we're lying. Okay, let's see what we want to... There are a couple of definitions, and I don't want to go through anything that you already know, but I also don't want to assume that we all know what we know. Um, by the by, what's wrong with this picture? What do you think when you see this picture? Does it look welcoming? Yeah, yeah. So if you love rainbows and your identity is gay or any number, great. I don't see any trans flags. I don't see any non-binary, no intersect, no progressive. But for a lot of well-meaning folks, like throwing that up there would be like, come to this. And by the way, <laughs> Calc did not create this slide. This is mine. Like I just put it up there. And I chose that graphic. But it's easy to look at that and be like, yay, see, now you know we're welcoming. Except that you're missing more than half the population that is out there. So this is just a small sample of pride flags. And if you don't recognize a lot of them, you have some questions to ask yourself. Holy cow, how many identities are out there? Now, some are more prevalent than others. Some are more public than others. There are choices, there are things. But you do see the point, I hope. It is not just the top row and it's not just the bottom row. It is all the in-betweens that exist, that are marginalized, overlooked, unknown, unseen. If you don't know, you're not seeing people. Now, I am not trying to say that if you don't have all these memorized, you are not the good ally you thought you were. That is not the goal. But the awareness and the understanding that there is a lot more out there and that there are people that you need to talk to and ways we need to educate ourselves, that's, that's what's helpful. My favorite gender unicorn. How many of you are familiar with this? Yay, isn't it great? So this is helpful in understanding. And I, my lens is, of course, as everything pertains to youth. And often when adults and parents that I'm dealing with see some of the youth that are in my programs, I get that kind of exasperated, well, okay, so one, one day they're dressing like this, and then they're dressing like that, and then they shave their head, and, then their pronouns are them, and then their pronouns are it, and then their pronouns are zizir, and I, how do I, what do I? Um, and so a few things that I want to point out. First of all, I think it's amazing that all of these things change, and that's called transformation, that's called growth, it's called exploration, but it's important to know that the identity, the expression, the sex assigned at birth, Physical attraction and emotional attraction, all very different things. There is no one, if this, then that, if that, then this. All of those are spectrums and all of them can change. You all have, all of us as human beings, I have a spectrum of humor, some of which will not be shared with you today. Sometimes it's more serious, sometimes it's self-deprecating, 
right? I have all these parts of me that come out at different times. And all of this applies to all people, where you feel more masculine one day and more feminine the other day. You want to wear boots, you want to rip the sleeves off your shirt, you want to do whatever you want to do. That's just expression. That doesn't tell you what my gender is, what my sexual orientation is. That's just the clothes I wanted to wear that day. And if I shave my head, it doesn't mean that I am now going to start dating different people. It just means my expression has changed. Your gender and your physical sexuality, two totally different things. Your gender is entirely up here. This is what you know about yourself, what you know that you know that you know who you are. And that's also why we keep going back to, we don't question other people's identities and we don't ask them to prove it because they know what they know and you know what you know. Super simple. And you cannot assume based on anything about their appearance that you know anything about who they are, who they love. That's not a thing. Um, and then physical and emotional attraction are sometimes also very different. And then there's asexual. Don't feel that at all. That is not a necessary part of my life. I will also say a really good critique of this slide is that it's linear and circles are actually I think a lot easier to work with because circles can intersect and overlap and sometimes we can just kind of walk that whole circle in a day. I might, it's not a matter of pick a side. I am more of this and I am less of that, but it's a circle. You can be anywhere on the circle. You can be smack dab in the middle of it. I am all of this today or maybe I'm kind of on the edge. And so I put this up here first so that you're understanding the very important distinctions between gender identity, sexual orientation, physical presentation, expression. And then also so you understand, it actually is really easy to see why there are so many different identities. Because you can be all these different places. And how awesome is that? Are there any questions about that? This might not be new at all, and it might be blowing your mind right now. I don't know. All right, so won't go through each definition. The only thing I want to point out, because I have to do this with, um, actually I have to do this more with adults than with kids, but um, attracted to some other female identified people. I just like to mention that, yes, Mike Gilly? Five, five minutes, man. Okay, moving right along. So all of these definitions are sometimes, like nothing is written in cement. Also, PSA, transgender is an adjective. It is not a verb, it is not a noun. That's also really important, okay? It is an ongoing experience. We don't say transgenders and transgenderisms. It's not a thing. There was a time where transgendered got tossed around, but it's really discouraged. It's not helpful because it's not something you suddenly cease to be. Now, somebody may cease sharing that as part of their public narrative, which they have every right to do, but it doesn't mean it was, it started here, it ended there, and then it's, it's an identity and it's an experience. Um, just pointing out, and this is, not even a short list. It's a pitiful breath of a list. I want you to be aware of how many identities there are. Oh, pronouns, by the by. So also there are neo-pronouns. So it is now very common to hear it, it's, and that, that's. And I know that's hard for some folks my age, right, for all the reasons, for some really good reasons. Because I grew up with that book, A Child Called It. A lot of people in social work did. And the worst thing you could do is refer to somebody as a non-human thing. And it is important to be sensitive to that. So I don't want to discount that. I uh, had a really lovely conversation with one of the youth in my group who uses it, its pronouns and is very, very adamant about that. And so we just said, let's have the dialogue. So I said, well, here's where I'm struggling, right? My goal is to make you feel included and loved and valued and it, it makes me think of everything that is not valued. 
And uh, this lovely little teacher had said to me, well, here's the thing, Kim. When you describe the sky, you say, it's blue today, it's beautiful. When you describe the trees, it's in bloom, it's gorgeous, it's this, it's that. Those are all the things that are special and important to me. And the other pronouns connotate people. And what's so good about being a person today? And I was like, oh, you win. Um, that was important to them. They want to be identified by things that make them think of beauty and lack of judgment and lack of shame. And if that is what it it's brings to that person, well, I guess I'm calling that person it is. And if somebody overhears that and catches their breath, like I did, I get to have a conversation about why this is so important to this young person. And identity is, every, is all of that. All of the kids I have worked with that have a, a chosen identity, they have given it a great deal of thought. And if it shifts as they move on, it's because they're still thinking about it. I can only celebrate that and encourage it. That's awesome, that's exactly what I want every person to do, is to experience it, figure it out, make adjustments. What are all the things I did not cover? Doggone, I didn't even touch any of this. Um, I really do wanna at least mention, when people are coming in through our church doors, we really have an amazing opportunity to, as was mentioned in today's homily, support the whole person. When anybody walks through our doors and we see a family with a young person and we think, oh, I am getting the vibes. I think this young person is totally either non-binary or trans or somewhere on the LGBTQ and they have come to us and we are so excited and we are gonna run up and we are going to, hi, my name is Kim and I use she, her pronouns. What are yours? Um, no 12 year old wants you to do that to them. That's calling out and not calling in. I want you to be welcoming but you will have pronouns on your name badge and you will have other ways in your church to let them know they are welcome, but just welcome the person first, person first, always person first, right? And the same thing with the parents, like they also need their community support and you're gonna be behind them with whatever poster they want you to carry and that's great, but also, you know, maybe he likes to knit and she likes to cook and they are looking for, to be in the choir, like that's also a thing. Um, so I just want us to be mindful of all of our excitement and enthusiasm uh, of, of also knowing when to step back and see the whole person, that there's all these things that need to be done. Um, and on that note, a, a quick note about misgendering anybody and young peoples. Um, it is really important to own that, own it. But that when I say own it, acknowledge it, apologize for it, and then move on. Um, I see a lot of, and we're all trying really hard, and I know that, and I get it wrong lots of times, but when we get it wrong, we're so distraught that we kind of go all over the place with apologies, and I totally know that, and I just want you to know this, that, and the other. When you over-apologize and get really dramatic about it, what you're actually doing is now forcing the person you're apologizing to to make you feel better about the fact that you may had a, a faux pas or an error. So keep in mind that you don't have to self-flagellate. All you have to do is apologize and move on, right? Acknowledging it is important, but making another person feel like they have to comfort you is not okay. So I did, I had that in my little star, be sure you say this, because I see it a lot. Um, are there any questions? I'll, I'll find another time to just keep talking out in the parking lot or something. <laughs> I really did want there to be time for questions. Yes? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, there we go. Other than your own. 
So you can be an ally in many different ways. You don't have to be, it doesn't mean you're set. That's why it says you may. But being an ally, yes, is supporting things that do not apply to you. Yes? Just briefly, I wonder if you could talk about a lot of these identities and uh, ways that we experience the world seem to be rooted in the way we've been presented here. I'm sure not a lot of time to cover all the things. Yeah. Yeah, let me repeat a little bit of what was said because that's really important. And for the folks at home and on Zoom, I want to make sure that you did hear that. The holding space for the fact that, you know, I'm referencing a lot of individual identities and if an individual comes into your church, but that there is a big community component to that. There is groups of people and there is exchanges between community and all of the peoples that live in that identity. Is that my doing that okay? I want to do that justice. Um, that it's not just this one person, but this is an, an, we're talking about entire communities that we are wanting to intersect with our UU committees, can, our UU communities, and also the intersectionality. Like there, these are all, none of this is mutually ex exclusive. And there should be a parking lot too, just for anything else you all want to discover and discuss if something comes up that I didn't cover and you're like, oh, I hope we get to this today, please feel free to name that so we can write it on the uh, flip chart and get to it in some form or fashion. And I would say even as you go through the day and things occur to you, feel free to write it up there yourselves because I'd be happy then to follow up later and Mike and I will talk about how do we make sure that resources are available. Um, because, yeah, some of this is going to be your individual journey and some of it's the journey of your congregation and it's all of our journey together. So there's that, too. Thank you for raising that. Thank you, Kim. Uh, next on our agenda is Rebecca Kling. And Rebecca is an educator, organizer, storyteller, and advocate for social change and also the co-author of The Advocate Educator's Handbook, Creating Schools Where Transgender and Non-Binary Students Thrive. An important topic. And there's an intersection, which is what led us to invite Rebecca to speak uh, with us, which is initiated through uh, Reverend Eileen Wiviat as we were talking and discussing about that having this topic, uh, Reverend Eileen suggested that we reach out to Rebecca. And in investigating and reading her book, I can appreciate there are a number of opportunities uh, within our congregations, within religious education programs that mirror the idea of school, even though we don't have the same uh, institutional regulations and or laws that might affect how we are and with our kids, uh, we want to be welcoming to everybody. Uh, Rebecca also served as the Community Storytelling Advocate and Director of Education Programming at the National Center for Transgender Rights, as well as on the leadership team of Harbor Camps, a sleepaway summer camp for trans and non-binary youth. She is also co-founder of Better World Collaborative, which is a social impact consulting firm working to combat the recent flood of anti-trans legislation. And she's living here in the Andersonville, Chicago area. Thank you, Rebecca, come on up. Hi, friends. Uh, so glad to be here. I'm going to put my timer on so I keep track of what's going on. Amazing. And I love the folks in the first row. If you want to get your tarps out, you may get some gender fluid on you. I apologize for that in advance. 
that's one of the like three trans jokes I know. Uh, one of the other ones, why did the non-binary prospector go to the mountains? There's gold in them there hills. I apologize. This is going to be 45 minutes of bad trans puns. Uh, I am Rebecca Kling. I use she, her pronouns. I am a trans woman. I'm also, uh, grew up in Evanston. I am a Chicagoan. I'm an aunt. I am a cat parent. Uh, I am a writer and a performer. And uh, I'm Jewish. I'm all of these different things. And growing up, um, I, I love some of the things that were talked about earlier today. Growing up, there was a lot of sense that there were all of these things that you could be. You know, I grew up in a household with an older brother where our parents brought us lots of different types of toys and the idea that we could be lots of different types of adults. Similarly, I went to, uh, quite literally across the street, Beth Emmett for um, Hebrew school very grudgingly and for Sunday school very grudgingly. And similarly, there were lots of ideas of what it meant to be a Jewish person and a Jewish adult. And at that time, uh, and I loved the language that was said in the homily, there was sort of gay silent, that it wasn't that there was something wrong with that, but it also wasn't necessarily affirmed and celebrated. And growing up, I knew that something was different about myself than other people seemed to be relating to the world. I knew from a very young age that boy didn't fit. And it didn't fit like having stones in your shoes or heavy rocks in your backpack or tossing and turning at night and trying to get to sleep and knowing you're uncomfortable but not show knowing what comfort would look like. It was much easier to say I am not that than I am this. And part of that was because 20, 30 years ago, the way that trans identity was depicted, I learned about trans folks from Jerry Springer. I learned about trans folks from online porn that I could find on the dial-up internet when my parents weren't home. I learned about trans folks from um, the youth group that I attended in the basement of this very building where the only trans speakers were older trans people who had transitioned later in life and who I find incredible value and deep appreciation for them willing to come and share their stories with youth. But as a 14 or 15 or 16 year old, it didn't feel like it connected to my experiences. And there have been so many changes since then. And thinking about what a couple people have touched on, if that is when uh, your congregation started learning about these things, or if that is when your congregation started writing things down or started making policies or started making trainings. There is going to be so much in language and identity and experience and culture that has changed since then. And I'm curious, I want to take a quick temperature check. So I'm going to ask folks to rate themselves on a scale of flutter fingers of agreement, so this means I really agree, to flutter fingers of disagreement, I really disagree. And it's a total self-rating. Rating yourself, what is your familiarity with language around LGBTQ identity? So sort of the whole umbrella stuff, and there's a range, all right, I see some fingers up in the middle, some down, great. What about specifically with identity around trans and non-binary folks? Awesome. And what I usually see, what I'm seeing here, is there's more understanding of those broader community terms and maybe a little less of specific trans or non-binary terms. And then I also want to ask, how awake are people feeling? How awake are people feeling? Yeah, there's a range of that too. And the last one, who else was so excited about the eclipse? I got to go down to Indianapolis, we saw the totality, it was, oh, just blew my mind. I've thought a lot over the years about what it means to me to be a relatively secular but still deeply invested Jewish person and what it means to be trans. And the thing that I like about both of those identities and both of those communities is there is no one right way to be either of those things. There is a joke in Judaism, you have two Jews, you have three opinions. There is a lot of disagreement within the Jewish community about what it means to be Jewish and what it means to be a good Jewish person. There is a lot of disagreement in the trans community of what it means to be trans and who is part of that community. And hopefully, in all of those spaces, we can respect each other through disagreement, we can support each other through disagreement. 
When I came out to my parents, I was about 14, and the language I used at the time, because this was the language that made sense to me, was I think I want to be a girl. And my parents did something amazing, particularly for the late 90s. They didn't reject me. They never thought about kicking me out. They never suggested that I go to conversion or corrective therapy. They never talked about cutting me off financially or stopping me from going to family events. All of those are incredible, but they're also things they didn't do. They didn't know how to be proactive. When I came out to them, my mom said, we will love you no matter what. My dad said, we'll love you no matter what you are, as long as you're not a Republican. <laughs> he knows I share that story, and he likes credit for that laugh line. But they didn't know what to do. When I wanted to play piano, they knew how to find lessons. And when one instructor didn't work, we were able to find another. When I wanted to learn to ride a bike, they knew how to take me down to the uh, parking lot near our house and, and how to practice with that and how to help with skinned knees if that was a problem. When I said I, did, I wanted to be a girl, that was totally off the radar. That was not in what to expect when you're expecting. And there weren't groups for parents or for trans youth. There weren't summer camps. There weren't books. There weren't TV shows. There weren't documentaries. There weren't conferences. There weren't YouTube channels. And so as much as they did some things incredibly well, they didn't have the tools and resources to do what I needed, which was that active support as a young person. And that active support doesn't mean setting out a roadmap, but it means helping figure out what's on the table. I didn't want anyone to say, this is how you have to do this, but I desperately wanted someone to say, here are some options and ideas. Let's talk about what feels good and what doesn't. And similarly, I give my therapist at the time big credit for openly saying, there's nothing wrong with that, and for openly saying, but I don't have a ton of information about how to help you now. And one of the big things that I want to encourage folks to think about are the three R's. That first R is respect. And that's the idea that I don't need to understand someone's identity or experience to respect it. And we've heard about that a little bit already. Kim was just talking about pronouns and how tricky that can be. And I was actually having a conversation recently with some trans friends about my age. Uh, some millennials, and we were talking about the it-its for very similar reasons is something that we aren't familiar with and that can make us uncomfortable. And also, if that's what someone is saying, that respect for them, that's the language we got to use. And so respect comes first. That next R is research. And by, do it, by being here, you're doing that. Because research is learning and research is growing. Research is also thinking about where and how to do those things. Looking up stuff online, reaching out to some of the experts in the room today, finding organizations like PFLAG, like Youth Outlook, that are going to be able to help with those tools. Research might even mean asking someone in your community, hey, where would you recommend I go to learn more? But that's very different from saying, hey, Rebecca, what was your experience? How does your body work? Who are you dating? I'm choosing to be an educator. I'm comfortable answering those questions. Maybe a little nicer than that with a little less finger pointing. But if there's a trans person or a non-binary person or a queer person in your congregation, that doesn't automatically mean they want to be a teacher. In researching our book, uh, my co-author and I spoke with a lot of trans youth whose teachers relied on them in school to be their educators. And some of those trans youth said, it was awesome. It made me feel invested and involved and like my teacher wanted to hear from me. And that's amazing. And some of those trans youth said, I didn't like it at all. It put me on the spot and it made me have to teach my teacher when that relationship should be reversed. So that research component should absolutely involve folks from the community. But it doesn't necessarily mean it should involve the specific trans person who just came out to you. And if we think about that in other communities, we can find parallels. If we're doing work to support disability rights, or people of color, or immigrants, or folks who are neurodiverse, any of those things, we're going to want to work with those communities. But it doesn't mean that any one individual has an obligation to tell us about what it's like to use an assistive mobility device 
or what it's like to be an immigrant or what it's like to experience racism. Again, we want to include those voices in those communities, but we want it to do it with and from people who are choosing to do that, not being put on the spot. I've worked a lot over the years with different parts of the trans community, and a lot of that comes down to story and storytelling. And so thinking about how do we elevate those stories and how do we work with, with those communities to find those voices. And thinking about the Advocate Educators Handbook, uh, my co-author Vanessa was a classroom teacher for a number of years, and she came up with these buckets, these ideas that from what she was seeing, Schools in particular, but I think this would certainly be true of faith communities, need to educate, thinking about both um, who is learning, so not just uh, direct staff, but also janitorial staff, or staff who are serving food, or staff who are helping with busing, because all of those are going to interact with communities in different ways. So we're thinking about educate. Affirm in both policy and practice, and those are sort of a teeter-totter, a seesaw. If you only have the policy and no one's following it, then what good is it? And if you only have the practice, then if a new person comes in, they can throw that out and change things. And to use some examples of the landscape right now, Illinois has some great policies at the state level, some laws, as well as policies at the county and city level. A lot of school districts, a lot of cities, Evanston included, have really great written policies. That's important. And there are classrooms in Illinois where those policies are being implemented really well. I can also promise you there are classrooms in Illinois where they're not. And where even though there is that law on the books or that policy in the district, it isn't being followed. And on the other side of that coin, in places like Texas or Florida, where they are actively trying to push bad policy, I know that there are classrooms where teachers are still amazing and affirming and are doing their job despite those laws. But ideally, we want both of those. So we want to educate, we want to affirm in both policy and practice, and then we want to include in community and culture. And community and culture are things like that photo that Kim represent, uh, referenced to make sure that when we're using language out in the world, we're thinking about what that language means. When we're talking about how do we represent our community as a, unit, uh, a congregation, that we're using language and imagery and all of those things that are inclusive. When we're talking internally, we're thinking about that language and inclusivity. When we're talking externally, we're thinking about that language and inclusivity. So educate, affirm, include, and the last one, and the one I'm going to talk the most about, is disrupt. And the, the way we are disrupting, and this is not the term we use in the book, but we're disrupting assholery, <laughs> which is a very technical term. And that can show up at an individual level, that can show up at a community level, and that can show up at a societal level. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But before we do, I want to continue something that Kim started us on, which is I want folks to just call out or at least think for yourself, what does it mean to be an ally? And I think the, the definition we had is a great start, thinking about how do we work with and for communities we're not a part of. What are other words that come up when you think about ally or allyship? Shout them out. Advocate, advocate. yes. Advocate is an action. It's something we're doing. What else? Education. Allyship often involves learning, and maybe it involves teaching as well. What else? Partnership. We're working with people, not just for or on their behalf. What else? Friend. Friend. I love that. That allies hopefully are also engaging in authentic relationship building. Yeah. What else? Oh, I, I heard. Elevate. Elevate. Yeah. Uplifting. Any other things? Helper, protector, yeah. Some using privilege. using privilege to assist. I love that. So thinking about what are places that we have more privilege, that we are less at risk, which is maybe another way of saying that. To use our voices, sometimes our bodies, sometimes our um, votes, all of these different things are part of allyship. Sometimes we'll also hear words like solidarity working with and for communities. Sometimes we'll also hear words like accomplice. 
I want someone who's willing to go down with me. I want someone who's willing to put it on the line with me and for me. So as we're thinking about allyship, I want you to think about all of that. And in particular, I want you to think about allyship sometimes being uncomfortable. That learning and growing can be uncomfortable for the learner and the grower, and it can also be uncomfortable sometimes for the teacher or the educator or the ally, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I also want to reassure you that as um, folks in this community, you already have so many amazing tools. We all already know how it feels to be welcomed and respected and supported. And so we want to flip that around and think about how can we offer that experience to others, whether they're part of the trans and non-binary community, whether they're people of color, whether they're people with different physical abilities or brains that work in different ways. We know what it feels like. It feels like being part of a community where there are others like us. It feels like being called what we're asking to be called. It feels like when there are photos or language describing our communities that we can see ourselves literally and metaphorically in those communities. All of those are parts of allyship. And I want to focus on disrupt because that's the scariest part. And that's also the part that is easiest to say, yeah, I don't want to do that right now. It's much easier to say, um, I'm going to go to an event on a Saturday and learn or I'm going to look at the policies and I'm going to put some comments in that Google Doc, or I'm going to think about what our newsletter is and how we can include more diverse voices in it. It's a lot harder and it's a lot scarier to say, ooh, that person really has a problem every time trans rights come up. Someone needs to talk to them. I would really rather it not be me. It's tempting. It's human. It's understandable. And so when we're thinking about disrupt, the first thing that I want you to, to think about is that sometimes you'll hear criticism of performative allyship or allyship that's just for show. That might be things like the um, I believe signs that are on yard signs. It might be things like wearing a shirt that says protect trans kids. It might be things like a beautiful Black Lives Matter sign outside of a Unitarian church. And I want to speak in defense of performative allyship for a minute. In a perfect world, those things indicate actions being taken. When I walk around my neighborhood in Andersonville in Chicago and I see LGBT pride flags or progress pride flags, hopefully that is also meaning that people are voting for those things and that people are kicking out staff or customers who are being jerks and that folks are supporting young people who are parts of those community. The performative allyship fails when it's just performative but when it's a signal of action, it can be incredibly powerful. One of the things we learned during researching our book is that the Trevor Project, which does work around LGBTQ students and youth in particular, found that students feel safer in schools where they have those rainbow stickers, safe space stickers. Not because the safe, and I see some shaking heads, and that's okay, and it's because the stickers are not magic. They do not magically make youth safer. Hopefully, they indicate that those are teachers who are willing to take action, are willing to disrupt. And so when we're thinking about things like name tags on, uh, or pronouns on email signatures, gender neutral bathrooms, those are indicators of hopefully deeper conversations that are happening. Hopefully those are indicators of spaces like this one where folks are showing up to do that learning and doing that growth. And acknowledging that that can be uncomfortable and can take time. This is stuff that I can almost guarantee most of us in this room did not learn in school, certainly not in elementary, middle, or high school. Many of us may not have learned it in college, and many of us may not have learned it until much later in life. And that's okay. It means it's hard. It means learning is, is growing. I know I remember when I was uh, going into high school, going into be a freshman, um, I had to do some catch-up algebra work. That sucked. Like, that was not a fun learning experience. Learning is not always fun. Hopefully, it is sometimes fun. And similarly, teaching can be hard and can be uncomfortable. And teaching others, particularly if they have set in their ways views, can be hard and can be uncomfortable. But learning can also be exciting. Learning is a way of opening ourselves and of growing and of finding others and finding commonality where we might not have known it exists. 
So I want people to think about disrupting first on an individual level, either internally or one-on-one -on -one with others. And that might mean things like, if you're thinking to yourself or if you have heard other people say, well, we already did the welcoming congregations thing, or I already have that pride bumper sticker or that Black Lives Matter sign or whatever it is. Thinking about what is the next step to action. How do I take that passive, I'm not a jerk, hopefully, how do we take that passive, I'm not doing things wrong, and move it into active, I'm trying to do things better? And part of what's scary there is it opens us up to failing. It opens us up to saying, hey, I didn't really like that language you used, and then being told we're wrong because actually that language is okay. Or hey, I um, really wanted to share this on my social media, and then being told actually we don't want to share that particular resource because it's problematic in this way. And I want to encourage yourselves to take those risks. I would much rather myself try to speak up on communities I'm not a part of and fail sometimes and be told, hey, Rebecca, actually that isn't the language we're using or actually that resource is, is, we don't refer folks to that organization because they've done this thing that wasn't great. I would much rather be corrected in that way and I would much rather look back and say, I stood up for it and was corrected or stood up for it and was taught than staying silent. When we're doing that, we can still start from a place of kindness. We can still start from a place of, as Kim and I certainly know others have talked about, calling in rather than calling out. And starting from a place of acknowledging that that change can be hard and that we can be patient and listen. There is huge value, particularly as allies, in trying to unpack where some of this hesitancy comes from. So to use a specific example, I use the word queer to describe myself. That's a word that I like. My dad doesn't like the word queer, and we've talked about it. He said, I grew up with queer as a slur. I get why you use it. I get why it works for you. It's not a word I'm super comfortable using. And I understand that for him. If there were spaces where it was really important for me to be identified as queer, I might ask him to push himself out of his comfort zone. But I can certainly respect where that's coming from. My mom, on the other hand, will still call me sometimes and say, my refrigerator is making a really queer noise. Do I need to call a repair person? Like, I don't know. I don't know how fridges work. <laughs> and so language absolutely changes, and the way we use language changes. And so we want to be patient and listen and try and do that work in ourselves of, am I uncomfortable purely because change is hard? Which, like, don't get me wrong, change is absolutely hard. Is there something deeper that I'm uncomfortable about? Sometimes in schools we hear about, I'm worried that I don't know what the curriculum is going to be. I'm worried that they're going to throw out math because now everything's just about being woke. And hopefully unpacking that and talking about, no, this is improving and building on curriculum, not throwing it out. Hopefully that can help on those one-on-one -on -one and individual conversations. It can also be helpful to get to that why so that folks can understand their own hesitation. I certainly know, very similar to what was just talked about, that I personally don't want to be called it or its, and so it makes it harder for me to put myself in the shoes of someone who does, but not impossible, and that that's a place that I'm learning and growing. I would also encourage folks to think about when and how to tap your allies. There are spaces where it's really important for me as an out trans person to do that allyship and activism myself, and when I say allyship, I can think about allyship to other parts of the trans community, allyship to trans people of color, who statistically we know have that intersection of anti-trans and racism that makes their lives harder. I can think about my allyship to parts of the community that have different physical abilities or capabilities and think about as someone who is currently mostly able-bodied, what can I do to advocate for and with? can think about neurodiversity, can think about different life uh, uh, ages and immigration and migrant status and document status and all of these different things that um, sometimes I'm going to be the right person and sometimes I may want to tap my allies. When I was first coming out, I emailed a friend group and said, I want folks to start referring to me as Rebecca and using she, her pronouns. And I didn't learn until many years later that they got together and said, all right, we got to practice this because this is going to be hard. Change is hard. 
And I'm glad they didn't say at the time. It would have made me feel very uncomfortable at the time. But I love, in retrospect, knowing that they took it seriously enough to work on it. And if this is something that you're having trouble with language or trouble with thinking about or trouble with working on, tap those allies. If it's language, to practice it. If it's um, thought or identity, to talk about it. If it's experience, to talk about it, to work through it, to go places together, tap those allies. Similarly, there may be spaces where I, as a trans person, don't have the energy or capacity to show up. And so I may ask my allies to make those phone calls or talk to that educator or teacher or talk to that community member so that I don't have to. When we're thinking about an organizational, so a lot of that is one-on-one. -on -one. When we're thinking organizationally, thinking about those both policies and practices. What are the written agreements that you have as a congregation or as a community? Are those being lived up to? Similarly, are there practices you've implemented around names or pronouns or language or identity that maybe haven't made it to those written practices that you now need to go back and say, hey, we've been doing this thing that really works and is making people feel more welcome in our space. Let's write it down so when that person moves or that person retires, we still have a record of it. We don't want to lose that institutional organizational memory. And then the last thing about disrupting is societal thinking about the current political landscape. There was a map in the Washington Post recently about education policies related to LGBTQ identity. There are a number of states, Illinois is one of them, that have affirmative proactive policies. Students in Illinois are mandated to learn positively about LGBTQ identity. There are a lot of states that have no policy one way or the other. And then there's an unfortunately growing number of states that have negative policies. And so when we're thinking about our own policies and practice, thinking about what are we doing to advocate at a societal level, at a political level, and how are we doing it with those other connected communities? So when we say things in the progressive movement like trans rights, our labor rights, our repro rights, our immigrant rights, our accessibility rights, our health care rights, what we mean is the folks who are trying to take our rights away are doing it for everyone. The folks who want to take away trans care also want to take away access to reproductive health care, also want to take away the ability to learn about the real history of and present of race and racism, also want to make it harder for folks to immigrate here, also are less caring and less interested in making spaces accessible for folks with different bodies and minds. That's not a coincidence. It doesn't just happen to be that someone woke up on the bigot side of the bed this morning. It's that there is a concentrated, organized effort to restrict the rights of trans people and the rights of people who carry children and the rights of people who have different skin colors and the rights of people with different faith backgrounds and the rights of people who are migrants or immigrants and the rights of people. It's, it's all part and parcel. It's a big, gross stew. And so when we're thinking about that at a societal level, if one of those is an issue that really is important to you, how do you also bring in the trans and LGBTQ communities? Because I promise you, whatever issue you're passionate about, there are trans and non-binary folks who are passionate about it too, and vice versa. And then when you're thinking about political engagement, encouraging folks to take action. Did you know you can call your elected officials and ask for their positions on things and leave your feedback? Did you know you can call up your elected officials and ask for in-person meetings? You might meet with a staff member. You might not meet with the elected official. But those staff members are the conduit of information. That's how they get there. You can write letters to the editor to say, hey, that coverage you just had was great, and I agree with it. That coverage you just had was awful and left things out. And there are tools and resources for all of that. You can also get involved with organizations like PFLAG, like Youth Outlook, like the ACLU of Illinois or Equality Illinois, like the National Center for Transgender Equality. There are organizations that want to do this work with you, want to support you in this work. And again, thinking about the other issues you care about locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. In closing, I, I want to again remind folks about those three R's, respecting people, telling who they are. Oh, I never got to the third R, did I? <laughs> Research, learning, and then the third R is relevance. 
I don't go to the trans dentist to get my trans teeth trans cleaned. There are parts of my identity where being trans is incredibly relevant. There are parts of my identity where it's a little relevant, and there are parts where it's not at all. If I'm going to a doctor for primary care blood work, they need to know I'm trans, they need to know what hormones I'm on. Being trans is relevant. If I'm going to get my teeth cleaned, being trans is not relevant. And if we're picking whether to have pizza or Thai food tonight, being trans has absolutely nothing to do with it. And so thinking not only about respecting individuals and researching about communities and needs, but thinking about is this relevant? Sometimes the answer is absolutely yes, sometimes the answer is absolutely no, and a lot of the time is maybe I need to talk with folks more and do some more learning. The Talmud in Judaism has a uh, phrase that I do not remember the Hebrew for, but I'm going to share in English, which is that you're not obligated to complete the work, but you're also not free to neglect it. And I like to think about that as none of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. Again, we are not obligated to complete the work, but we also don't get to put it down. And so what I would encourage folks to think about is what does that mean? How can I continue this work knowing it's not going to be finished in any of our lifetimes? I think a lot recently, particularly in the last couple of years, about movements that were multi-generational. The abolition of slavery. What did that look like for someone in 1815? Women's suffrage. What did that look like for someone in 1890? The civil rights movement. What did that look like for someone in Jim Crow? Marriage equality. What did that look like for someone in 1975? There are all of these movements that have taken lifetime to make progress and that we are now seeing some really scary backsliding. But that doesn't mean we can't keep fighting and that doesn't mean we can't keep learning and growing. So we're going to have a little bit of time for questions. Again, I am explicitly putting on my educator hat. Um, I think today it's like an educator top hat. I'm going to do one of those. Uh, and encouraging all of you to ask yourself, okay, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to learn? Where am I going to grow? What actions am I going to take? All right, let's have some questions, some conversation. Thank you, by the way, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a kind of something that I've experienced personally a couple of times, and I'm wondering about your opinion, um, where I have been in a public setting and witnessed um, kind of cruel behavior toward somebody who is trans or non-conforming gender. Um, and it's been an, an instance where it was a brief moment, so, I'm, I did not intervene because I didn't want to embarrass the person who was being treated that way. And, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on how one might address that type of yeah. thing. That's, I think that's a great question. And that is sometimes where the rubber meets the road, where when and how do we intervene with others? And there are a couple of ways that you can think about that. First, it may be appropriate to, at the very least, tell that person you saw it and that really sucked, that thing that just happened. Um, particularly if it looks like it was an interaction where the, the jerk has left, just going up and being like, hey, I saw that, that seemed really lousy, I'm sorry that that happened. To just acknowledge that it happened and was seen and was um, a shared experience. It may be something where um, you can give that person a safe out. So not around trans identity, but I was... Um, walking uh, uh, home from the L one time, and there was a woman who was clearly being harassed by a stranger. And I had never seen this woman before. I went up and very enthusiastically greeted her as an old friend and said, I'm so excited, let's walk to Clark where we're going to meet up with people. And we walked maybe 15 feet with each other before I was like, you're cool? She's like, yeah, I'm cool, and we went our separate ways. And so giving someone that out of, oh my god, it's so good to see you, yeah, let's go, let's go, we don't need to deal with this, let's go, can be a way of not confronting but still having a pressure release. And then depending on the situation or depending on your comfort level, it may be appropriate to intervene, particularly if you do feel safety in other ways. 
as someone who is white, there are spaces where I may feel comfortable intervening that someone who is an, a person of color may not. As someone who has economic privileges and health insurance and like a father who's a lawyer who I can call if I get arrested, there are ways that I may be comfortable intervening that other folks aren't. Um, I would also encourage you to ask yourself, and this is not an easy question to answer, but what's going to feel good later? And I would say usually doing nothing does not make me feel good in the end. But there are a bunch of different somethings ranging from that acknowledgement to that trying to scoop up and bring someone away to a more direct intervention. And all of those have pros and cons, but thinking about what am I going to both be comfortable with and feel physically and emotionally safe myself, and what am I going to, what's going to help me sleep at night to have done something versus nothing. I hope that helps. That's, those are hard situations. You're all so smart. We did it. We you have no it. questions. We're done. Wow. <laughs> Our work here is done. No. <laughs> There's a question. Hi, I'm on the board of Parents of Trans Individuals Chicago, and we meet on Zoom uh, once a month, and uh, we're pretty much all the people who come are white. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how we could reach out to parents of color. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And that's a tough one in part because, um, spoiler alert, we live in a society that has lots of issues with race and racism. And in particular in the Chicagoland area, we live in a, a society that is dealing with the legacies and, and currents of redlining and of geographic separation. Um, a great way to start may be to engage with different organizations and community groups. Um, so the um, Brave Space Alliance is a, a black and POC-led, trans-led um, LGBTQ community group on the south side, and they may have some resources. Reaching out to organizations like Broadway Youth Center that serves different demographics in the city. And trying to find um, ways to engage with folks who want to and are willing to do that engagement. So one of the tricky things that there's somewhat of a chicken and an egg problem with how do we engage with any community that we're not necessarily a part of but that we want to have more inclusion of. And so the, the chicken and egg thing is the best way to have more folks from a community is to have people already from that community who can bring them in. And that is sort of a paradox. And so I would think in part about when and where and how you're distributing that information, and so what um, places may be, or, or either geographic or online spaces that may be different organizations that you haven't worked with. And it may also be reaching out to organizations and seeing if they have any recommendations for learning more. So Brave Space Alliance is a great one in the Chicago area. Uh, BTAC, which is the Black Trans Action Coalition, uh, may have some particular resources. Uh, and thinking about um, what is the work that as an organization and as individuals y'all are doing to think about anti-racism in general and how are you making your um, work in your community engaging more with folks who aren't like you. And I think that feels also like a great example of um, what Kim and others have touched on of the chicken and egg of how do we get people to come so we can build it and how do we build it so people know and we can get them to come. That is, I think, one of the um, most important and hardest to talk about things because looking around the room today, um, lots of folks who have similar skin colors to my own and that is the same question of how do we get folks in a space that they aren't already in and there's no perfect one right answer. So I hope those are some helps and some clues, but I wish I had a better thing. That's something that Harbor Camps, the camp I work with, has been talking about for a long time, that it's not a space that has as many people of color, and part of that is it makes it harder for people of color. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then we might have one other question or time, um, it may also be worth seeing if you can engage with some of those groups or if there are particular groups that already exist for communities of color or for parents of color that um, 
those more specific affinity groups may have space or resources or capacity to help with broader sort of integration of groups. You're welcome. Yeah, maybe one more. Yes, there was a question, and this might be a question not just for you, but others uh, that are Unitarian Universalist ministers and and others in here that are uh, uh, able to help with this. Uh, but I'm going to direct it to you. And the question was, how can you address someone who is not comfortable using pronouns? This might be an older person. This might be somebody who grew up in a different era. There are a few in our congregation who are questioning the use of pronouns all the time. That was a question from online. Thank you so much for, oh, there's that. I'm directing, looking in your eyes. Thank you so much. Um, that's a great question, and that's a really uh, tricky one. And that one is one where I would say, ideally starting with the individual level in a non-confrontational way. So someone who is already comfortable, already has a relationship with that person, might be a great time to tap those allies to try and learn a little bit more. Can you help me understand? It might be a fear of getting it wrong is a really understandable reason to hesitate to do something. It might be, I was taught this, and I'm really worried that this is going to take us down a slippery slope to grammar anarchy. And it can be reassuring that, that we're wanting to refer to people how they use, but we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're still concerned about important written and, and speech communication. Um, it may be that it makes me uncomfortable because it's bringing stuff up about my own gender or my own thoughts that I've never thought about before. Um, and so taking that time, not forcing trans folks or non-binary folks to do that, but including them if they want to and are comfortable to be included, but trying to get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one conversation and then eventually, and this is going to be different depending on the group and different depending on the um, stakes in the situation, eventually it may need to escalate to this is the policy and this is the agreement in this space. And at some point, and I can't pretend to know where to draw that line, at some point, if you can't use respectful language, we're going to ask you to not show up in this space anymore. I don't, that is not, I think, I think that is not the first thing to go to, but I do think it has to eventually be on the table that if you are refusing to respect people by calling them what they're asking to be called, at some point that is a problem. And sometimes it can be helpful for parallels, and then I would love to hear from other folks, particularly in the community, for, um, it can be helpful to be a parallel. If my name is Rebecca and I ask you not to call me Becky, and you keep calling me Becky, it kind of just makes you a jerk. Like, it doesn't mean you're standing up for my name, or it doesn't mean you're standing up for the rights of grammar. It, it, at some point, it kind of just makes you a jerk. And so thinking about that as well, of how do we try to gently start, but how do we also be willing to escalate that pressure? I'm curious what other folks think, yeah. Thank you, I'm, I'm gonna give this to Reverend Susan. Yeah, I think please. you had an answer, maybe as well. I just wanted to say within the UU context that we have as the principles that we have agreed upon the inherent worth and dignity of all people and the search for truth and meaning and that we to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations but to talk about we don't expect anybody to force upon another person a theological belief so why would so why are you feeling that you need to force upon someone your version of their identity and to reconcile it in, in that larger way of how we are as, as a faith community and what our values are and how we live those out in those one-on-one -on -one conversations. The other thing that I would add to that that was mentioned earlier is it's, and I, we've, I've heard this before too, it's not that they want, a person wants to disrespect someone else's pronouns, happy to use other people's pronouns, but just find it irritating that they have to disclose their pronouns every time they introduce themselves. And, and my response to that feels like referencing what we had said earlier of you don't have to understand it to respect it. It doesn't mean you have to say, I think this is important. I feel good about myself when I introduce myself with pronouns. And I think it's okay to say to another member of the congregation, you're not doing this for you. 
And I'm not asking you to agree with this, and I'm not asking you to understand it. But as a member of this community, where you show up every Sunday or Thursday or Monday or whatever you do, because you are here to support members of your community, I'm reminding you that you're doing this in a way that is meaningful to somebody else. And is that not enough? Is that what you're telling me? I like that a lot, yeah. Any other comments or new question? The one other thing I'll say tying back is it can sometimes also be helpful to acknowledge that it can be uncomfortable and hard to change how we use language. And that for many of us going back to learning algebra, for many of us, we maybe haven't had to do that in a while. And that learning, particularly if we've done something a certain way, it quite literally rewires the brain and that takes time and effort it's worth that time and effort. And t touching on what you both just said, yeah. Okay, I think, unless there's another question. And I'll say that um, Mike does have my contact info. I love continuing to call, talk about these conversations. Uh, so if there are things that come up, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Rebecca. So we, uh, we, those of you who brought a lunch, this is the time where you may enjoy it. And if you didn't bring anything, we have some snacks uh, that are in the kitchen that we invite you to share. And I think there's uh, some liquid refreshment available as well in case uh, you're thirsty. And we're going to rejoin uh, here at 12 o'clock, so it's about 20 minutes from now, for panel discussion. All right, thank you. Please keep, hey Adam, test, hello. Just a quick note to remind everybody that 
Representatives from PFLAG and Kim from Youth Outlook are here available during lunchtime to talk. And uh, please, uh, please do introduce yourselves and see how we may be able to link better with our allied organizations.
Hey, Adam. Oh, thank you. That's like magic. Please uh, come on back. Everybody that's been having lunch, if you want to continue having lunch, I think they allow eating food in the sanctuary. <laughs> but please come, table of countryside people. <laughs> come on back in. All right, I think they see. Please have a seat or I see Jordan. <laughs> okay, welcome back. Thank you, everybody, for, for sticking around here and for uh, your questions and for sharing, being in community with each other here during lunch. I know it's a short time, and we understand that uh, if we could have a much longer period for networking, it would probably be appreciated. But it's a beautiful day, and eventually we're going to break and enjoy that. But before we do, we have a lovely panel discussion and breakout groups that we look to have this afternoon. And I'm joined up here on the stage and on the screen behind me by our panelists. And uh, what I'd like to in invite each of them to do maybe a, a brief introduction of who you are and uh, what congregation you've been affiliated with. And, uh, and I'll start with you, Wilbur. Hello. Oh, can we make sure uh, Wilbur's microphones are operational? I think it's turned on. Hello. Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, hi, my name is Wilbur Mickelson, or Wilbur Godfrey Mickelson. Uh, I use all pronouns. I belong to Unitarian Universalists in McHenry, and I'm happy to be here. Hi, my name's Freddie Fennell. I use he, him pronouns. I'm also comfortable with they, them. And I also belong to the Tree of Life UU in McHenry. And Jordan? Ooh. It's muted. Or. Is that better? Yes. Okay. My name's good. They, them, pronoun. I belong to you. The weapon stuff. And Jordan, you're a member at Unitarian Church of Evanston, correct? I am. Okay. So uh, I have some questions, and I also have, you know, the opportunity to uh, to ask our panelists to share their own questions and answer their own questions that they have. And then we'll get to uh, audience participation as well to be able to ask questions. And just as a first question, wanted to ask about uh, in your experience in attending a Unitarian Universalist congregation, uh, what was it like the first time you went there? What were the signs that said this is a welcoming place or things that maybe didn't feel welcoming? Why don't start? Uh, how about, Freddie, how about we start with you this time? Okay. So the first UU that I went to was the UUFA, which is the Fellowship of Ames, Iowa. 
and I had originally gone to a lunch group that was happening on Sundays after services. A friend kept trying to get me to go, and I kept saying no because it's a church. They don't like people like me there. And he kept saying, no, it'll be fun. Let's go, let's go. Long story short, I had a broken foot, and he goes, hey, let's go out to eat. And I said, okay, and we pull into a church. Um, <laughs> so I was tricked into being a UU, but I'm very happy about it. <laughs> um, we went up, and I saw a room that was diverse with multiple you know, identities, um, generations, um, abilities, um, not very diverse color-wise, just because it's central Iowa. Um, and immediately everyone was just, I'm happy you came. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy that you're here for lunch. How can we feed you? What can we give you? And then I was like, maybe I should come to a couple more things here. And I was hooked because it felt like family and they showed me with their actions that I was safe and that I was wanted. Thank you, yeah, go ahead, Wilbur. How about you? I'll use this. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Okay, we're good. I'm gonna be honest, I joined my church in like third grade. My mom made me go. Um, and so for a while it was just her, then my family went, and then I didn't go to church for a long time. But when I first started going, I went to all that stuff for little kids. And at one point we did, I think it was some sort of auction or something, but it was kind of a parent only event. And so they were just gonna usher all the little kids to the basement. And I was the only little kid there. I was, there wasn't any other children. And so they brought me to the basement and there were these two women that were married to each other and they were so kind to me. I just thought they were the best. They showed me pictures of their cat and I made it a little like hat, a little paper hat, and I just spent the entire evening with them having the best time of my life, not even really knowing, oh, these are two lesbians. <laughs> I didn't really think of that, that I just thought they love each other, you know? They're having a good time. And then, you know, during quarantine, I didn't go a lot, but once I came back, it was kind of like, um, as one of the speakers talked about, that kind of like rush, like, oh my gosh, we know you use different pronouns. We know, we're so happy to have you here, oh my gosh. Put on this name tag, like, please come every year, or come every week. Um, and that felt a little, <laughs> um, I didn't really want to. And I still don't go all the time, but when I do, it's a very welcoming environment. Um, I've never been discriminated against or felt like I didn't belong. While it isn't brought up a whole lot at my church, it is something that I feel very welcome to bring up. How about you, Jordan? Yeah, um, the time I walked into the community, I saw the bathroom and the Pacific there's a basket. Jordan, it's 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 difficult to hear you. You could could you move the microphone closer? Uh, yeah, but then, thank you. Um, bathrooms, pronoun tag, explicit welcome from the pulpit. Um, and I could see people had like rainbows. And things like that on the pancakes. Pardon? Yeah, we're we're wondering if the audio quality might improve if if your video was turned off. For some reason, it's. Yeah, it's cutting in and out a bit. But, uh, 
not making much difference, not too much. And, and Jordan, what you, you had mentioned in a conversation we had earlier about what even brought you at first to a UU congregation. Maybe you can share a little bit about that. We'll see if we can hear you. Yeah, so I had gone to a UU church in California where I lived for like a year and a half. Moved back to Chicago right after Donald Trump was elected the president. I was listening to a podcast and the hosts were saying, get in community. It's the, you know, it's the only way we're gonna make it through the next four years. And so I knew that I wanted to be part of a community. I planned to check out all the churches in the area, but I made it to UC and just never really left. So you, I remember you said that the thought was to get into a safe community at that time after Donald Trump was elected. Right. How about, uh, were there any uh, particular efforts that, that were engaged in that felt welcoming to you when you first started attending? And then this is directed to Jordan still, and then we'll, we'll go around. I think that came more later. There was, and still is, an LGBTQIA plus group. I think the specific education around trans and gender non uh people came later. I took down as some notes from, from Jordan when we were first speaking about this, that uh, some of the things that uh, were practices that uh, felt very welcoming included things like the use of pronouns and the, a basket full of pronoun tags that were at, at this congregation. Uh, the fact that there were gender neutral bathrooms with some explanations of why why they're gender neutral and why it's okay for people to use whichever bathroom they appropriately choose. And uh, the one thing that I noticed that uh, Jordan had mentioned that I thought was, was interesting was uh, that there was a renaming service, a celebration of renaming. And this uh, topic of renaming is kind of interesting. I, I, uh, today I had a rename myself uh, I joined a Zoom meeting, and there was a button that said rename, and I was able to type in a name and pronouns. I was able to name myself, and it was that easy. But if somebody who actually needs to rename, somebody that wants to be called something different and have legal documents that are uh, corresponding to that name, that is a very difficult process, unlike pressing the little button on the Zoom application. Uh, how, about, how about for each of you, anything else that you noticed that, that, that was feeling welcoming? Once you were attending, once mom wasn't making you, Wilbur, show up, was there anything besides a lesbian couple sharing pictures of their cat <laughs> that make you feel welcome. There's nothing that I can pinpoint specifically, but there were a lot of, you know, efforts to get more youth into the church, and they really tried to get me. They were like, please, please, please. I volunteered for a few of those. But just the fact that they, I could really tell that they wanted me to be there. And that they didn't care what any of my orientations were, that they just simply wanted me to attend, wanting me to show up, and that just felt really nice to see, just fully accepting me. How about for you, Freddie? And I guess you could speak to both, you know, your experience in Ames as well as locally. 
Yeah, so um, for this part, I was actually gonna say for local with the Tree of Life, I've only been going for about four or five months, so I'm still fairly new. Um, but one of the things that really stood out is I started getting invited into conversations specifically regarding my community. And it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was expected of me to be in these conversations, but it was holding the door open and saying, we'd like you to talk if you feel comfortable, if you can, if you have the spoons. And, and that to me is just a huge sign of welcome of, we want you here, but we're not going to force anything. How do you like people to support you? What does, what does that mean to you when I even say that, support you? What? Um, I can talk. I like a lot of silent support almost. So I want someone to know that they are there for me but not constantly. I don't want you guys to come up to me and say, I'm an ally, like, I'll support you. If someone tells me they're an ally, okay, prove it. <laughs> um, and so it's just a lot more helpful for me to show it in your actions. You know, I have friends that will actively dispel people that I don't really want to deal with at the time, or I don't want to confront them. I don't want to tell them that what they're doing is not okay. So just my friends showing up and helping me with that kind of behind the scenes, not as openly, is just really helpful to know that I'm not different than anyone else and I can just be treated as a person not someone who is actively identified just for being trans or queer. I'm Go gonna echo Wilbur's words. Um, show it with your action and not your words. If, if you tell me I'm a, that you're an ally, I'm gonna scoff at you also because that's your words. But showing us by inviting us to the conversations, by calling me to apologize if you've misgendered me. That happened recently and it meant a lot to me. Um, it totally ups my respect for the person, um, stuff like that. And advocating for us, um, it gets very exhausting defending um, our, our identities every single day. Um, and if I have a friend who steps up and corrects someone before I get a chance to, I love that. I get, I get tired, and, and when you think about, you know, in this 45 minute session, if your friend gets misgendered one time, that's 45 minutes of their week that you're seeing, that's 45 minutes of their day. Imagine that that happens every other 45 minute chunk and how exhausting it is to constantly have to be like, no, I'm a man, my name's Freddie, you know, or, or my name's Wilbur, you know, don't call me these other things, use these pronouns. Whereas if you can step in and say for us, like, hey, that's he. Um, that, that alone does a lot. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff that's seen as performative, that's not support, that's not allyship. Um, that's just performative to make yourself feel better. Ally is about supporting us and not making your own self individually feel better. Thank you. How about you, Jordan? How do you like people to support you? Um, yes, yeah, same. I appreciate it if I don't have to be the one to correct misgendering or being called the wrong name. I have friends who would call ahead to restaurants so that I would make sure that there was a bathroom I could use, and I always appreciated them doing that labor so that I didn't have to. There was the, the topic of, of disrupting or interrupting, sometimes it might be called. Uh, how, how do you feel about uh, people within your congregations and your friends, for that matter, uh, engaging, engaging somebody when they see harm? In, is, is, is it happening? Are you getting that support in spaces like this? Like are you at your UU congregation? 
and outside of the UU congregation. So, Is that oh, oh. If, if Jordan wants to go first. Jordan, you could go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just asking. Um, I think it's a fine line. And I think that, or I appreciate when people have a conversation with me about what my comfort level is. There are certain places where I'm willing to have my gender pushed harder and other places where I don't feel comfortable with that. And a lot of times I don't necessarily want to engage. So I think, like I appreciate people who are willing to try, but I also think that it's important to have a conversation with the person if they're around, right? That you're gonna be interrupting on behalf of and I think if you're just doing it in the world, then just being thoughtful about it. Thanks. Freddie, you go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I might fall outside the norm when it comes to this because in like societal standards, I love chaos. Um, <laughs> and so I will disrupt if need be, um, but I know a lot of people, even within my own circle and other people that might be trans or non-binary that don't want that disrupt to happen and would rather just have it all slide away and not have some of that happen. And so it's gauging the person. And if we're in a community, ask the person if something happens, how do you want me to handle so that I'm not causing the disrupt that you might like um, or that you might not like, um, simply asking it. But if it's me personally, I give permission to disrupt because I will thrive in it. I don't like confrontation, I'm going to be honest. Uh, in my congregation, I don't really have a lot of issues with this. When I do show up, people aren't being openly rude to me, openly just disregarding anything. But in my school district, as going to a very, my high school's nicknamed Preppy Ridge, so I have some issues with that. There was one kid who decided to dead name me for one entire school year after everyone had moved on. And so my friends very continuously, I just decided to ignore him, very continuously yelled at him, told him that was not okay, explained to him why. But there are other circumstances, maybe with close friends and things that just really haven't gotten it yet that I ask my friends to just take a step back, you know, and just let it be. So a lot of my friends have continued to ask me as someone's coming over, like, hey, if they do something that might upset you, do you want me to speak out? Because they know I won't. And I'll just say, you know, just let it go. But thank you for asking. And that really means a lot. I'm going to use the word ally, and maybe the word ally needs to be changed because, and I appreciated the reaction from all of our panelists here when we talked about uh, the use of the term ally. Like ally, for me, if I was to say I'm an ally, which I, I wouldn't say, but if I was to say that, <laughs> and I'm going, to say, I'm going to tell you why I wouldn't say it, it's like saying I'm great. Okay? Please give me credit for being great. Acknowledge my greatness. Right? Be great. Right? Be great. Be an ally. The action is what's important. It, it, Wilbur's going to say something, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say an ally is like almost two words to me. It means I'm a friend. I'm there if you need me and I support you completely. It also means give me credit for doing that. <laughs> so I think another way you could say, I'm a friend to all, or like I will support you, things like that, while not using maybe the word ally specifically, just because it has so many negative connotations. 
Go ahead, Fred. I like to tell people that you cannot self-identify as an ally. Right, right. So the question that I was going to ask that uses the word ally is what other actions or support can allies and advocates engage in? What other things? Um, allies, you know, you don't always have to go to protests or hold up signs or things, but it's really just a form of almost being thinking of it as insignificant, you know? I'm going to be friends with you no matter what, and I will support you in anything you do. I'm not gonna just support you just because you are a trans person. I'm gonna support you if you choose to change your gender identity. I'm gonna choose to support you no matter what, just simply as a friend. I'm not gonna support you as one specific thing that you are, because really that's not what being an ally is. And I do agree that ally is not just a sticker term that you can put on anything. I have had a lot of friends tell me, oh, well, I'm an ally, so I wouldn't do that. And I said, I haven't called you an ally. Who told you that? Who told you you could say that? Because I've never heard you stand up for anything. And so it's hard for me to confront people like that, but I think it's important, even if you are an ally, you can confront people to say that. Hey, maybe let's don't throw that word around, but yeah. Uh, Freddie, why don't you go and then we'll come to Jordan and ask the same question. Thanks, Fred. Okay. Um, shoot, I focused on the microphone and forgot. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, Again, you know, the not calling yourself the ally, the, and, and I used to say, like, imagine what it's like to be me. But if you're cis, you can't do that. You, you literally cannot imagine what it's like to be trans because you don't know. But I think something you could do is imagine if I'm just going about my life, you know, if I'm a cis woman, I'm using the women's bathroom and told, nope, you can't go there. That is something that you can imagine that you can relate to and think of how that feels and I think that that's an easy correlation. But also listening to what we say about different things and choosing not to continue to invest in things that harm us. So it might be, um, you know, you're an ally, you want us to know that, so you might stop reading books by an author who's an issue. Um, Yes, specific. Um, or maybe you stop eating at Christian Chicken. Sorry if that name offends anyone, but um, there's too many people that we see that say, I'm an ally, they wear the shirts, I'm an ally, and then they show me that they're not an ally because they want, eat this, they want to eat this chicken that you know contributes financially to conversion camps. Uh, that hurts my community. Allies don't hurt the community. They help, and they elevate, and, and that's what needs to be done. It needs to be elevating our voices, listening to our struggles, and really thinking about what happens, and then choosing to, to stop having things that you love based on that, because we also had to make these choices. We don't choose to put ourselves in these situations where harm can come to us. And I've seen people like, well, I don't want to take part in that harm. I don't either, but I don't get a choice. So as an ally, you also need to not have that choice. Thank you. Jordan, how about for you? What other actions or support can allies and advocates engage in? Um, I don't have a ton to add. I think it starts with educating yourself, not expecting the trans person to do the emotional labor to do so. And then I think living from that place, you know, I, I think it's hard for cis people to understand what it feels like to be trans, but I think they, everyone can look at gender as a spectrum, see where they are, and see the ways in which it influences their life. And 
just try to make them easier for people who are on the trans or non-binary part of the spectrum. And Jordan, when we were speaking previously, uh, you had another great idea uh, that you shared with me that I'll, I'll mention a couple things and you can add more color to it. But there's a, a law that's been enacted in Illinois involving bathrooms at restaurants and other businesses, single stall bathrooms needing to be bathrooms for anybody, for all gender. And there's, there's things we can do as people that have privilege and power and money in bringing to the attention of those business owners when they're non-compliant, how they could become compliant, and based on maybe the reaction they have uh, to vote with your money to go away from that business if they seem to be opposed to complying with the law and just basic human dignity. I'll let you say anything else you would like, though, Jordan, on that. No, that's pretty much it. <laughs> but yeah, using privilege as a cis person to have that conversation. And then backing it up with that. Saying, okay, well, I won't be patronizing your establishment. Um, I don't know that it going to change, but, but if enough people do it, maybe it will. And if I was sitting somewhere and heard someone have that conversation with my manager, it would feel really good to me. Kim, did you, if you want to say something, you're going to have to probably get a microphone because it won't be heard by... I just, I just want to make a quick uh, PSA on that allyship and to the point that you and Jordan are making that if you're an ally, these ways that when it comes to some of these laws, you don't have to wait until it's been passed and it's a problem. Like some of these, that was a good law that they were talking about, right? But there are a lot of really easy ways to get on a mailing list where you're getting alerts when things are in discussion in the House and in the Senate, in the State House and the State Senate. It doesn't even have to be federal. And it is, I think, really important for allies to be paying attention to this, not just be moaning it later like, oh, that was really unfair and terrible. If you know about it ahead of time, there are always those, per those slips that go out. There's always a window of time before your local senator, congressperson goes in and votes on this stuff. And there are slips that are made available. And so all of us as allies then need to be flooding their offices with slips that say, don't vote on this, this is bullshit. And I mean, you could probably phrase it nicer. Um, but get out ahead of those things because that's kind of that allyship that Freddie was mentioning is not helpful is if, if you're an ally and that means you walk around and moan about that terrible law that went through. But the real question is, what were you doing when they were debating it for the last two years? That, that's where you can really do have impact. Thanks for bringing that up. And uh, I'll remind people that on the back of the agenda uh, is some resources that I listed. And there's a whole nother stapled sheet that Karen put together that was also handed out to attendees that has resources. One of the UU resources we have is the UU Action Network of Illinois, UUANI. And there is a, a URL for being able to sign up to be informed of different sort of uh, house bills that are coming up, for example, for vote, where you can submit a witness slip. And it takes 30 seconds, a minute to do. It's really easy once you sign up. You, it pre-populates most of the information and you just customize anything you want to say and you're done. And there is upcoming legislation uh, in Illinois, House Bill 5164 that I also reference on the back here, 
uh, modernizing the name change law, which is specifically related to what I was bringing up earlier about how easy or difficult it is to change your name. So I have a question, another question for, for, for I'm gonna start with Wilbur on this, because I heard that you might have made a video that you might have shared with some people, and maybe you can talk about what it was and why you did it, if you wouldn't mind sharing. This was a video I made in middle school. So basically, uh, there was a GSA in the middle school. It got pretty much disbanded because no one was showing up. But it was talking about you know how to support uh, young queer people and such. And I was not happy with the kind of support we were getting in that school system or in pretty much any school system I had previously visited. As I shook my head at talking about those, um, the stickers that they put on classrooms, I was like, that doesn't work. Specifically because I had had so many experiences with teachers um, either over um, protecting these queer youth by saying like almost, I have one teacher who likes to collect them as like little pets almost. So she treats them as her favorites and she constantly talks to them as like, just treat us like normal people. I had one teacher in middle school who I was talking very confidentially at GSA with um, this young girl who wanted to transition, but she was in a family of Mormons and she just did not feel comfortable, but she wanted to go by the name Candy. So I said, I'll call you that to you personally, but of course, since you don't want it to pass around, I'll call you your dead name outside of that. And the teacher rolled around to the desk we were at and said, do you want me to change your name on the forms? Do you want me to like start telling teachers about this name change? And we kind of were like, I thought you said we were, you weren't listening to us. You said that, this was confidential. And while she was trying to be an ally, it wasn't working and she was kind of overextending herself. So I wanted to make a video with the help of one of the social workers, Ms. Kavganka, at the school basically addressing to teachers how exactly trans youth feel about what they're doing and how they can further support uh, the students. I don't remember exactly what I said in the video because it was three years ago, but um, I do remember that teachers uh, from my middle school and high school will come up to me and say, oh, I watched your video. Like, I watched it, which is a little awkward. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, I think it's important that teachers are seeing these videos from students because you know it really helps us outreach to them when you don't want to really talk to them specifically or out anyone, you know, when I could just tell these general stories. Um, so that was really nice to see. And going to be a and carried on as con and my ideas about it. Ultimately, you know, there's not the time for that. Um, I suppose if I had something, you know, like final that I would want to say on allyship is, I don't know, have someone point out a good ally to you and model yourself after them. Um, you know, f find that person. Um, we have a, a good friend who, when someone close to them came out, they went home and they spent hours researching what that person's life was gonna be about before they came to the person to ask questions. So it was, you know, the research first and they didn't put that, that educational um, expectation onto the person and instead came later with, I read this, is this correct? That's a great way to do it. Um, and, and just think about, you know, when you're doing things, would I like it if this was done to me? Especially with some of that like overprotective or this, you know, would, would I like if someone did this or said this to me or about me to someone else? Um, because I think that gets forgotten a lot in I need to prove I'm a good person, I'm a good ally, 
but I don't see that overstepping because I don't take into the consideration of what that might mean or if I would like it myself. Jordan, how about you? Is there a question we didn't ask that you'd like to answer or a statement you'd want to make? You know, I like the dinosaur part. <laughs> that we're here to talk about being under the trans umbrella. I'm so much more than that. And it's refreshing to talk about that. My favorite dinosaur is the Triceratops. <laughs> <laughs> we have some time for being able to take uh, questions from uh, our, our attendees here. Okay. Okay. Karen, would you mind? Uh... Thanks. Uh, I'm Irene Raven from Tree of Life. My pronouns are she, her, her. Uh, as uh, I have been uh, working on our welcoming renewal committee and delving more into how I might better be a part of a welcoming community, I am beginning to feel that I need to always have great humility uh, approaching this, that I need so much, I need to learn so much and I need to be willing to be trainable. Uh, but I, <laughs> and I don't want to use the word but, still trying to decide when to say something or be there. Uh, last week I was downtown and there was, uh, I, I, we were across from the Art Institute and frequently there are people playing drums there or whatever. Well, there was quite a big group of people there that had big signs. We were going elsewhere, but I kind of stopped briefly to look at the signs across the street. And um, because they were playing bagpipes and they had a drum a couple of drums and you know almost like a three piece band or whatever and it really there was one huge sign and then another small sign and there was a Jesus on the sign and as i'm reading this because there was a lot of verbiage i'm realizing this what is going on here and in front of the art institute because it was um having to do with not having anything in the books about, in, in textbooks, we have to, you know, get rid of the stuff in textbooks that talks about LGBT, not even Q or whatever. And then the other sign said something about um, uh, down with the LGBT or something like that. I, I, I should have taken a picture, but I was so dumbfounded. And again, I'm across the street and it's disturbing me, but I, don't even know if I ever thought to go across the street and confront 20 some people to say what are you doing how do you how does one be um, engaged when something like that is going on and you're one person and they're 20 um, I definitely would not recommend going over to them being like that's not cool you're so awful oh my gosh because yeah they are 20 people who all have the same belief who might beat you up but one thing you can do call in a, a noise complaint call the police be petty about it even if you can't stand up to them directly do something that'll ruin their day just a little bit make them think about their actions because direct confrontation isn't always the best approach like Wilbur said, your safety is important. And, you know, in a situation like that, it's not worth putting yourself in the dangerous situation. But this is the second time I've heard you talk about this incident. And part of the reason that I named you directly as an ally, I have given you that title. To somebody in conversation this past week, that was one of the reasons, and I gave multiple reasons of why I said, Irene is an ally. She is a true ally, and, and here's why. Not because she tells me, but because she cares about our community. She wants to do better. She does this and this. 
but what you're doing is helping because now more people know about this going on. And if something were set up again in the future, there could be a possibility of, if you know people in the area, of getting your own group together and then you can have a peaceful confrontation. I'm not saying, you know, go and beat them up before they can beat you up. I'm saying if you get 20 people that are willing to also have that conversation, you know, and you can get it down to like one, you know, one voice from each side, but still everybody listening and everybody feeling comfortable because they have people of like mindedness, that's something, you know, taken from the first experience moving forward is something you can do. And now there's how many other people that have that idea of what they can do because they've heard you share this experience and ask for the assistance. So it's not that even though it wasn't done in, at that same point in time, you have actively done things multiple times since then to try and help prevent it from happening again. And I think that need to improve is also really what makes you an ally because even after so, you continually thought, I should have taken a picture, I should have gone up to them or things like that. That is something that's truly important to see in a lot of people. I was just talking to my therapist the other day. She did not exemplify this. And she told me that she saw a man on the street wearing platform heels and she rolled down her window and started snapping at him, saying, yes, yes, I love your platforms, yes, yes. And I was shocked. And I looked at her and I said, why would you do that? What if he wasn't comfortable? What if he literally just wanted to go to the store and get groceries? What if that was the first shoes he put on? Like, you don't know his situation. And even though you're a woman talking to a man, you're snapping at him. Those are the same tactics that people catcalling use. And she did not doubt herself whatsoever. She said this with pure, just like, yes, I did this. Aren't you so proud of me? And when I said, no, I'm not, she said she started defending herself instead of admitting I shouldn't have done that. Thank you for telling me. And in that way, she was not being an ally. So I think the need to better yourself and learn more information really shows that. Jordan, did you have any response to what Irene was uh, talking about, what to do? Yeah, I think I'd be mindful about especially if there are any people. But I would try to figure out and where they're going to be and show up with or, you know, more people than they have. Maybe bring one of those dinosaurs. Yeah. Hard to go wrong with a dinosaur. <laughs> How about I, any other questions? I have a question. Um, I, I have two family members who are trans women, and both of them, as part of their experience, have had times in their life, and one of them still has times in their life, where they're spanning two worlds and they are out to some people, and they're not out to other people. And I'm just wondering if any of you have had that experience and would feel comfortable sharing your, you know, a little bit about that. Um, and if you haven't or don't, that's okay too. I wanna say that I think it, I can only speak someone who gets read as masculine. And I think that trans femme is a different experience than I've had. But definitely in the early days of me understanding trans, I was out in my life other than at work. Um, and I was moving towards coming out when getting a new job and just, you know, never using be her pronoun at that job. But it's a lot to keep track of. And it doesn't feel good or didn't feel good to me to feel like I could bring my whole self to that space. When you first said trans woman, I got scared because I can't speak to that experience as a trans masculine person. 
Um, and then as a side note, I do wish that there was someone trans femme on the panel just so that we could have a more accurate representation of, of the lives. Um, but I understand you do with what you can. Um, I, what I, I originally tried to come out when I was 14 in 1999. Um, there was not time and space for that and surrounding other things in my personal life. It just, it wasn't gonna happen. I tried to come out to a few close friends um, they were like, no, that's not who you are. You're just a lesbian. And I wanted friends more than I wanted my own son. And um, let them choose who it was. Um, and I don't know if I can count that as me being to some people and not other. Because I don't know how many of those people retained that conversation after that point um, of me saying this is who I am, who I think I am, compared to now. Um, when I came out again as an adult, um, it was an immediate, I was not close to anybody because I was ready to shed off society's view of who I was supposed to be based on um, the gender I was assigned at birth. I do have a good friend who did have to do, um, due to living with family and um, being so um, uh, dependent upon them for his survival, did have to hide um, his transition from them. And it was very difficult. Um, you know, the best I could do was tell him, you know, we're around that needs me to as female and by his name that I will do it also going to be information because I knew he was in that hard situation for me and my friend specific that's how we were able to handle it um, because it is a difficult situation and it's difficult for each individual in it um, I think having a conversation with them about you know even when we're, you know, even when it's in a place where you have to be this person that you know you're not, how can I support you silently? What can I do? Is there a special hand signal I can give you that's validating to remind you that I know the real you and that I love and respect the real you? And, and that alone might be something that could help. I'm still going through this currently just with, um my family and friends, you know, they're fine with calling me Wilbur and everything. And even though I've been out for, I don't know how many years now, um, but in doctor's visits and dentist visits, I just don't care that much. I don't see them very often. So I kind of just, at this point, I'm too scared to mention it, that I don't go by my dad name anymore. So I just kind of, you know, bear through it, grip my teeth and stuff. But as someone who has to deal with that, just almost either not bringing it up at all, not making a deal of like, oh my gosh, that was so weird hearing your, your real name or things like that, um, and just kind of giving them confirmation that that's not your name anymore, that I understand that, but I'll call you whatever you want, really. Thank you all for sharing your experiences. Are there any other questions from our attendees? Okay, then we're gonna shift gears to breakout rooms. And uh, I have a handout that I'll, I'll pass around to everybody to serve as uh, prompts. But during the breakout, what I, I hope we'll take time to do is to try to answer question, what actions can we take to be more inclusive and create welcome? And looking at that through different lens, the lens of within yourself and your family, within your congregation and your community, within our region and state, and in our country. And those are, that, that's a lot of ground to try to cover in what will be 45 minutes of time that we've allocated for this. So if you can't get to all those questions, it's not important. Uh, what's important is that we get this dialogue going about what are actions that we can do. And at the conclusion of the 45 minute period, 
we're going to regather, and I think it's going to be in room six. Is that correct? Room six, number six. Uh, because room six can accommodate everybody that's here, as well as uh, online people that are still with us, and we'll be able to uh, uh, recap what we learned in each of the individual breakout groups. And please spend time with people you don't know, and you know, join a breakout group that's not just your friends from your local congregation so that you have some diversity of ideas that you might pick up on and be able to share with others. And with that, I want to thank Wilbur, Freddie, and Jordan for sharing your life experiences with us and uh, your time with us. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. There is, oh, excuse me one second. There is a, a Zoom link for those of you who were streaming the YouTube that I had uh, sent a meeting invitation. So the Zoom link uh, is uh, where you should go next if you would, would like to participate in the breakouts. Can I make so one can I oh, announcement? sorry, yes, announcement. Hi. Um, I just wanted to invite you to um, go to YouTube and watch the March 31st service that was held here at the Unitarian Church of Evanston. We live streamed them. It was um, Easter and Trans Day of Remembrance, and my daughter gave the reflection at the service. It's about eight minutes long, and um, it was, uh, I'm, it's a very proud moment for me, but I think if you're interested in these issues, uh, her uh, reflection, uh, I think, would be of interest to all of you. Thanks. So for the breakout rooms, um, those of you online, if you'll go to the Zoom room, um, Adam's putting the link in the chat, and I will join you shortly. For folks who are here in person, these stairs at the back of the sanctuary, if you go down those stairs, um, all of the breakout rooms are downstairs. If stairs are not good for you, if you go back into the lobby, there's a ramp that'll take you down to the elevator, that'll take you downstairs. If you are um, LGBTQI plus identified and you would like to have a space that is just with other folks who are LGBTQ identified, that'll be in room 12. Otherwise, um, we should have five to six people in the other breakout rooms and they're room 13, 10, or six, and there's, it says Cock Conference Breakout Room next to the door. Um, if you get in there and there's like seven people, maybe go to a different room, because we should have about five or six people in each room, and those are open to everybody, regardless of your identity, those three rooms, 10, six, and 13. Please pick somebody to take some notes so that they could be shared at the conclusion of the breakout. Please pick a note taker.